My guest today is Rhea Dixon. Rhea, how are you today? I am pretty good today. Doing well. So am nice. I. How are you? So am I. Thanks I'm for good. asking. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I'm really excited to talk to you. And uh, the reason is because, uh, well, we met in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and you're from, from Kansas City, right? Yes. Yes. yes um, Kansas City. So I, I, we tra both traveled to the Grand Rapids and we gave similar talks. I, I didn't know that one before I got there. That I, We both gave a talk on code reviews. And so I sat in yours and I thought yours was excellent. And I, I, I'm really glad that yours was after mine. I, I didn't want to have to follow yours. That was how good it was. <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and so I wanted to have you on my show. Let's talk about code reviews. Let's, can we um, just start? What's a code review? Yeah, so for code reviews, there are different types of code reviews. You can do um, like a group code review where you're right, reading line through line about code or even um, just sitting with someone and watching them walk through their code. But my particular talk was about doing pull requests for code reviews. And that involves like your peers or your, your team lead or whoever else that wants to come and learn about the code, going through a change line by line, looking at it to make sure that it's the best solution. And so that was the, the key of my talk was doing pull requests uh, for code reviews. Can you define a pull request? Yes, for a pull request. So if you are using a version control system like Git, um, like Git with GitHub or Bitbucket, then a pull request is the code that you have pulled down to your local development environment. You wrote it, you changed something, you want to get it merged back into the main branch, mm -hmm. and there it's a gate. So the gate is that you can't merge directly to main on your own. Someone must review your code. You submit what is called a pull request. I've heard it also called a merge request or a code request type of update. And with Git or in GitHub, you'll create that, that pull request. You'll go out to your repository and someone can look at the differences between your changes and what's currently in main. Got or whichever branch it is. Got it. So this is a safety thing. So make sure that some renegade developer like me, that, that I, won't, <laughs> I won't check in some nefarious code without at least another person's eyes looking at it and, and right. vetting it, making sure it's okay. Um, yeah. And then, uh, so wh but why do we do it? I mean, what's, what are the benefits of So one of the benefits of doing code review is that, well, there's several benefits, I think. One of the main benefits that most people lock into is that you're getting that quality gate on your code base, yeah. which is um, keeping you within the constraints of your whatever your architectural decisions are for that particular project. So like, let's say that your project is a full stack project built with React and Java. And one of the constraints that you have architecturally is that you're going to minimize uh, third party libraries to things that have to have unit tests, they have to be well maintained, um, currently maintained. And so one of those things is like if someone comes in and they say, hey, we're adding this new library and we go out and go take a look at it and it's not being maintained, then that would be a reason to say, hey, we don't want this in our code base. Or maybe you've inadvertently sent it into, you'll inadvertently trigger it, an infinite loop by either not including something or including too many things in your dependency array for mm -hmm. React. So kind of like a best practice or better practice, because I don't, I'm not necessarily sure if best is always the right word because I think it's relative best for the moment. Mm -hmm. um, another benefit of code review for me, for instance, is uh, rapid onboarding. So mm -hmm. typically from what I've heard and what I have experienced at previous roles, it takes about six to eight months for a developer to get familiar enough in a code base to want to go in and break things, maneuver things. I know exactly where this lives. I can go and fix it or I can go and update it. I can pick up any ticket and run with it. Six mm -hmm. to eight-ish months. And some people think that it's longer. I work at an agency. So I work for BML. It's a global a uh, creative agency, we do marketing, branding, and then the, our technology enterprise solutions arm, we do it, everything from innovation and data to engineering and web and mobile development. I'm a director and I do web and mobile development for BML. The, the thing that happens with an agency and with my contracts is that my contract scopes are usually three to six months with a client on a project. Mm -hmm. So I don't have, you don't have six months, months to get up to speed. Yeah. 
<laughs> right. By the time I'm up to speed, it, the project's over. So I needed a way to rapidly onboard. Mm-hmm. The way that I do that is I go do pull requests and pull. Re- I do code review via pull requests okay. because the things that are actively being worked on, the things that are actively pain points or actively issues, actively features, all of that's the code that's about to get merged in. All the rest of it is legacy stuff, right? As soon as it goes in, it becomes legacy code. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's one way to get rapid onboarding, get rapid knowledge transfer, get to know where the stuff is in the code. I've had a lot of my developers on my teams ask me, you know, how do you know so much about the code base? Did you write all of this? And the answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, that's over 30,000 lines of code. And I did not write it all. I did read as much of it as I could, though, and enough to connect the dots and bases. Um, yeah, and you're reading the active parts of the code, the parts that people are actively changing. Yes, yes, because then I can find things like helper functions, and you can't always find those on your own. I don't know where they live. Right. Perhaps this code base is spread out, you know, not necessarily uh, a conformed structure. Sure. There might not be like a set structure to it. Yeah. And that's that could be for any reason, whether it was everybody had a, a task and we kind of pieced it together and it's now an amoeba of technology <laughs> or, <laughs> you know, maybe it was, you know, maybe it was the prototype and now we are working on scalability and maintainability. So there's, there's reasons why you might not be able to find stuff. Sure. Even if it's well organized, if it's large, it's still, it's still, the, it adds complexity and it's hard to right. find things in a complex project. So I see, two, I hear two things. One is just making the code ways code base better, I'll put quotes around better because that might just be right. adhering to your standards. Uh, and the other is the knowledge sharing, just getting people up to speed on what the code does, how it's structured, what uh, what kind of things are being, uh, what kind of yes. patterns are being used, things like that. Those are the, those are the I think, the two big areas you just covered there. Yes, yes, those are my two that I hammer home. All right, it, sound, it sounds time. awesome. So I guess probably everybody is doing code reviews, right? Because it's so awesome. I wish everybody was doing code reviews because it is so awesome. So your answer is no. Why are people not doing this awesome thing? <sighs> I hear a lot of reasons why people aren't doing them. Some of them are because uh, of domain knowledge and expertise. So if I'm a back-end developer, I don't know anything about front-end code. I'm a Java developer. Why do I need to review this JavaScript? Mm-hmm. Or I'm a JavaScript developer. I'm a front-end developer. Why do I need to review this back-end code? I don't know what I'm doing. Or maybe it's a senior developer's code that a junior developer is afraid to review. Well, you're the senior dev. Yeah. You're, you know, I, I can't review Who your code. Who am I to criticize your code? Exactly. Your- so they, all of those reasons, and then the major one, the major one is that it takes too long to time. do a pull request time. To, it takes too much time to put the gate in place. We need to go fast and get to production. And I need my code in the code base so that I can continue to go fast. Uh, those are. Yeah. How, how do you address that? I mean, time is illegitimate. We, we all have a finite amount of time. How do we justify taking time away from our, our task from writing code to go you know, set aside an hour or two to review code. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. So the time aspect of reviewing code, I think that if it's taking, I personally, I don't think that a PR should live longer than about 48 hours in most cases, like 48 hours is tops for me. I do think that they last longer, but they last longer because of issues with process and issues with understanding what it is that we're after in the code review. So, and, and the definition of time that's involved, the time that it's going to take to get this particular task, this ticket, whatever it is, this feature to done and to complete. Yes, you can get there by pushing without doing code review, but what happens when you've introduced regression down the line for something that was already accepted, already active in prod, already functioning, and now something that we introduced that did not get reviewed goes out and breaks this thing. One particular instance, um, so for one of a, one of the clients that we have worked on, there's three different entry points into an experience. The three different entry points, there's a, um, a web portal, there's like a, a dealer's web portal. There's So we're talking like cars, right? Okay. Car manufacturers and car dealerships. So you want to schedule service for your car. There's 
you can do it on your driller's website. You have your owner's portal, like you can log in from your desktop or your phone and do your owner's portal. Um, or you could use like an app and that app could be on your phone, your iPad, it could be in your vehicle. You can click this button, let me go schedule service for my car. All of those different points, if we're using React because React lets us use reusable components and pass props and things, then that means that there are probably similar, compo similar components across all of those entry points. And if there are similar, uh, those similar components, those reusable components, maybe I only want this to happen in the app. I don't want it to affect the mobile desktop experience, the web experience. But not understanding the context of how that works, we've introduced a regression. So yes, I changed the size so it would fit for this in vehicle machine or fit for this tiny phone, but I've also changed the size for desktop and uh, didn't realize I was doing that. That's an unintended consequence that uh, yes. I as a mobile developer might not realize. Right, right. And vice versa. Right. Like if I don't do mobile often, then I'm not thinking about the fact that I set this minimum width to something that's not going to work right. if I want three tiles on a small screen. Mm -hmm. um, those kinds of changes. And then there's also just, you know, breaking functionality. So perhaps we had a particular set of ternaries set up so that we could not going to infinite loops, we could redirect traffic as we needed to be directed. Someone comes in without that context and changes the smallest thing from throwing an error maybe to providing, you know, an empty string. And now we've broken the desktop experience, but mainly because we didn't have the context. We didn't know. Yeah, this is the butterfly effect, right? And the butterfly yes. flaps his wings in Indonesia and it causes a typhoon in Japan. <laughs> and, uh, yes. But you know, I, I tweak a bit of the code over here, not realizing that this change over here is going to affect, have significant impact on some other code over there, which is dependent on. Right. And if, if that code that you introduced or that we introduced, I like to say we, if that code that we introduced to the next environment has caused breakage elsewhere, then we are not done with our task because we yeah. should not have broken production. We shouldn't have broken what was already existing. Um, and so that time does not always get counted. Uh, okay. And, yeah. So the, the, yeah, there is time to, to uh, invest in performing a code review, but you're also saving time <clears throat> by yes. catching these problems earlier that, uh, that, uh, they're going to cost you a lot of time. You know, this, the shift left principle, right? The, the yes. sooner I can catch this thing, the little cheaper and faster it is to fix it. If it goes into production yes. and somebody finds it, I have to fix it. Well, that's a very expensive change. There's another the other aspect that I get from taking time, um, they're like, oh, these code reviews, they take forever. Sometimes it's your, the size of your change is too big. Okay. The size of your change is too big. And for my front end dev teams that I've been currently working on, I've been working on some front end, some back end, and some full stack, most of what we change shouldn't be any larger than about 10 file changes, tops, depending on what the change was. If it's just one component, then maybe two or three files tops because you're doing styles, you're doing some sort of integration of this component that you wrote with whichever other components you wanted to work with, but it shouldn't be that large. And managing the scope, managing the size, doing a more bite-sized uh, code change, you'll get more people actively looking at it because I don't personally enjoy reviewing 88 files of uh -huh. code changes, but I understand when those cases might need to happen. I just hope that my code author also understands it's going to take me a while to get through 88 right. file changes. Well, that sounds like a best practice then that uh, if we can reduce the scope and the size of our changes, that'll make code reviews easier, less painful. Is that? Yes. Uh, are there other things that we can do to improve this process? Yes, I think so. I think the shift in the mindset from, oh my gosh, this is taking forever to, hey, let me help unblock my team mm -hmm. is paramount to getting people thinking more about, oh, this isn't just about me taking time to provide a quality gate. It's also me helping my team member to get to done. And most teams, I'm assuming here, making a grand assumption, but most teams are, we're all on the same side. We want to create the best work that we can, deliver the best solutions that we can, and hopefully write code that we don't mind having to maintain next week, next month, next year. And if we can get that done up front, then that's 
to our betterment, it's to our to our benefit. One of the things I like to introduce, if teams do not have team norms and if they don't have team norms and team expectations in place, I highly advise getting team norms and expectations in place. Team norms will help everyone get on the same page about what we're doing and why we're doing it. So we introduced one of our one of my teams that we they were not doing pull requests, but we introduced an experiment. They already had team norms in place. So I'm like, you are set up perfectly for this. The norm should be unblocking your team first thing in the morning. We're on different time zones. So we have some that are East Coast, some that I'm in Central Time. There's some that are West Coast Time. Well, what do I do that hour-ish before most people get online to do stand-up? I was like, well, we should unblock our team before we get started for the day. If you, there's code to review that's out there, you should take that time, go review code, help us get unstuck. And also learn something while you're at it because everything that I've touched so far for this project is connected to something else happening in this project. It's not an island. Right. Um, there, there are no islands in this project. So starting early, starting, get them blocked at the beginning of the day. Also having a couple of designated reviewers would help. Um, if you're going to do that, though, that needs to be rotated. I don't think that any one person should have all of the knowledge and all the burden of reviewing the code on their own. Right. Um, that makes the life of, say, for instance, that usually gets put on like your team lead, your project lead, your architect, oh, hopefully not your architect, but sometimes your architect is also bogged down with that. Um, there needs to be some sort of level of trust, though, that they can say, hey, I know that we went through this and we asked questions. And we found better, you know, this is a great way to do this. Let's, and it's within the constraints. I don't think that code review is for enforcing your will upon people. Sometimes folks will take it that way. Like, let me, no, you can't do that. And I'm like, there's more than two ways to do most tasks. Yes. And, very little dogma in the software world. Right. Right. And my question is not, is this my preferred, my favorite solution, but is it a good enough solution that fits within the constraints of this project, constraints and scope of this project? If that is yes, then, and I don't know how they did it, I'll ask a question, how does this work? And if it's not, for some reason, the, you know, a great solution, a good to great solution within the constraints of this project, then I will point out what's not it what's not adhering to the constraints i will also adhere i'll also point out ways hey if you if i see that you're rewriting a wheel that i know already exists i will guide you towards the wheel i'm like hey see that you're doing this particular type of function you're checking x y and z we already have a helper function for that over here i will even link to the line of code for them in my comment so it's easy to go find it um as a reviewer i'm trying to make the review process easy for my author. And as an author, I'm trying to make the review process easy for my reviewers. You, you bring up a great point that I, th I think there's a myth that the author, the code author and the code reviewer are, there's some sort of adversarial relationship. But I think you pointed out that they have the same goal. They both want to write quality software. And yes. so they should think of that way. They're not, if I, if I point out something in your code that could be improved, I'm not criticizing you. I'm helping you meet your goal. Right, right. And I think that authors feel like they must make the change that was suggested every single time. I don't think they that don't. that's the case either. You should encourage discussion to happen on your pull request. And if I, if I did a certain implementation and not another, and I can't figure out why your suggestion is better than mine, I will ask you, well, why should I do it that way? Or, you know, what's the benefit? Not necessarily why should I do it that way, but what's the benefit of making this change? Or maybe I've already tried that. Hey, I tried that already. However, I ran into this issue. So this is the implementation I went with. And one of two things will happen in that, that last case. It, there will either be a, hey, well, let me you know walk through this with you so I can see maybe we're doing something inadvertent. Or maybe I didn't think about that being a problem. You're right. Continue on. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. Oh, if I'm reviewing code, what are some of the questions I should be asking myself as I'm looking at someone else's code? So things that you should ask yourself if you're as you're looking at someone else's code, I call these um, my ill my illities. I would and scope. So I would look for 
Hopefully you're using a PR template. If you are not using a PR template, GitHub has great examples of templates. Um, and I can link you to some later, but the PR template helps to provide context for the reviewer. What I do when I look at our templates, there's a link to whatever the ticket was for the task that's being implemented. If there's not a ticket for it, why are we working on it? Um, because it's not tracked and scoped to, for my business, right? For the, the for the client, they want to see, they want to be able to tie work to an actual value. Okay. Um, even with technical debt, we track our technical debt too. So for the ticket, I want to go and find what is the scope so I can shift my context, find out does this change that is written down hopefully in the PR's template description, does the change that happen, is this a solution to the issue that we were trying to, uh, trying to address or trying to solve for? Is this solution fit for that? Um, and that's just going through my template. I'm looking as if it's a visual change, does the, does the code actually match and line up with that, that visual change? I might've pulled down the code base and tried to run it locally because it works on my boxes, not acceptable for enterprise level customer facing web solutions. It has to work out in the wild as well and on other people's boxes. As I'm reviewing the code itself, I am leaning into my areas of expertise with it. So I identify mostly as a backend developer, although I am full stack, I use my logic, my analytical skills. I wanna go review the functional parts. I might start small first though. I'll go to like the lovely little smallest changes, the files with the smallest changes because they're gonna be the easiest ones for me to collapse. GitHub has this great little feature called viewed, a little viewed checkbox. So I can say, hey, I viewed this. Either I had comments on it or I didn't, but I like collapsing down my file changes so that I can uh, check off that I've looked at this part. Wow. Uh, so I like to start small first, but I do lean into my area of expertise. And then I start working from the bottom up. I read from the bottom up of my code. That is something that I picked up from writing many, many essays in English class and having to do review of other people's writing. If I'm reading it from the bottom up, I'm less likely to manufacture my own words that don't actually exist on the page. So if I'm looking at a sentence, like say versus if you're reading a book or you're reading something and it's missing a word, okay. your brain may just fill in the word. Right. So <clears throat> and when I'm doing that, I read from the bottom up, so I'm least likely to do that. If I find, okay, hey, this looks like to be a gate, right? It's some sort of, like on a continue button. The continue button has a condition. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, now I see that there's this condition I can go and check that function, see, does that make sense? Where where does that connect? I can go and find variables and variable names that I can assume if it says that this is a, a valid option, like you can continue only if you've selected a valid option. I, the code that I go and find should be validating whatever that option is. I should be able to find where that is valid and verify that it's written in a way that won't break. But those are the kinds of logic things that, <clears throat> excuse me, that I lean into. I also lean into my accessibility experience. So that if I see point. that we have buttons, like an icon button to close something, but it doesn't say close the modal, mm -hmm. I'll point that out. Like, hey, we should probably have a close here. Or if there's a carousel that does not have arrows, I will also point out, hey, where's the advanced? How do I know that this is a carousel? How do I know that there's more content? Where does that happen? Um, other things that I'm looking for are appropriate applied styles and style systems. Like, so with style changes, we have a style system uh, that we are, a design system that we're using. And I wanna know, are we using the styles that we have in the design system or have we created our own? Why did we create our own and not use the, the things that we have in place? Or someone writing a brand new button when we have a button factory, a con you know, a, we've, we've created a custom component so why are we not using the custom component and just writing our own right. um, in those cases? That stuff pops up in your story acceptance because all of a sudden, why are the colors different for this button? Why is the hover different for this button? Well, maybe we're not using our custom button because we handled all of that in the custom button uh, so that we don't have to redo it. And that could be a knowledge transfer thing. Maybe the person writing the code didn't know about these, mm -hmm. these, these libraries, these designs, and these... CSSs or whatever you're using. 
Um, right, right. Uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, this is all really good stuff. You're, um, is there anything that we haven't covered you feel is critical for people to know? Uh, I'm trying to think. It's more, I think that mainly it is like your mindset yeah. of your team, your processes and procedures being set up in your within the team um, and doing things in a way that people still feel like people after the code review because the code review is not about the person. It's about the solution um, itself. So I think that we hit it all. Awesome. I just want, I, I wanted to talk about uh, some uh, personal stuff here because I'm looking at your LinkedIn page. I noticed that not only have you been with VML for a long time, but you're also doing a lot in the community. You're involved with Kansas City Women in Technology, and you are or were a Cub Scout leader. Yeah, I was a Cub Scout leader. That was fun. That was a fun time. <laughs> ah, that sounds really awesome. It was you know, so you have a passion for this uh, helping out others in the community. I do. I do. I think that it is important to help other people understand that they can do a thing, whatever that thing might be. Usually it's because they haven't seen themselves in this position or someone that looks like them in that position to do that. They and they or for whatever reason they haven't had exposure. I only became a Cub Scout leader because I saw another woman as a Cub Scout leader. I was like, you can do that? I was like, well, I would love to. I'll volunteer. Sure. Why not? Were you a den, a was, den mother? Yeah. Awesome. Well, I was, um, I was a den mother at one point, but then I was like just an assistant Cub Scout leader oh, to the, the, to the, the head the pack. leader. <laughs> yeah. To the pack. It was fun. It was so much fun. And we had a lot of, um, we had, cause we had a lot of young boys at our church at that time. And it was, kind of cumbersome reeling them all in. They were at different levels um, in the program. And so I did the, I would, I would kind of like bounce back and forth between some of the younger ones. And I would let our, our pack, I would let him go and do the older kids. Like you have the older boys, please. Awesome. <laughs> I don't want to deal, <laughs> but, but that was a lot of fun. And then with KC Women in Tech, they were the first organization that I, went out to go and take a look at, mm -hmm. or one of the first organizations, um, when I was pivoting into tech as a, as a software developer. And so I went to a coding and cocktails event and- Two of my, met, two of my favorite things. All <laughs> right, right. And it was so much fun. It was a safe space for women and, um, and not men to learn how to write code and build a website. And at mm -hmm. the time, I hadn't seen that anywhere else. And so I thought it was fantastic. I came back to do the hackathon the next month. And then the following month, there was um, like a holiday party and you got to meet all the rest of the people that contribute to Kansas City Women in Tech because it's not just women and it's not just about women. Um, on the board, there are men and women that are on the board of Kansas City Women in Tech. We do tech talks where we will, we're seeking out first like uh, women for to be speakers. Um, but we will also have men be speakers in those roles. We had a program called Coder Dojo for kids where the men that, uh, that are contributing to our community come in to be teachers um, for teachers and mentors for that program. Also, we do different short, I was going to call them boot camps, but like a boot camp style workshop day for, uh, we do Angular Girls and Jang Django Girls. And our guys will come and contribute their technical expertise to those roles as well. And I absolutely love it. It awesome. was, it was a great experience from what I first was introduced to, to where I just jumped in both feet. <laughs> like, let's do this. <laughs> All right. Well, I love that you're sharing knowledge with them. I love you're sharing knowledge with us as well. And I really appreciate your time. <laughs>